chair. Uh, and then we'll open it up for any commissioners who have called in. Um, and this is Chris Hoagland, Air Director, MDE. Uh, I am the, the climate change team at MDE with Mark Stewart, Program Manager, will be helping facilitate today's meeting on behalf of Chair Dorsey. Uh, so we have Chair Dorsey, we have co uh, co chairs Ann Lindner, Kim Coble, and Charmaine Brown. Uh, we have uh, Hans Schmidt, proxy for Secretary Bartenfelder. We have Secretary Hadaway Riccio. We have, um, I believe I saw uh, Spiro Papademus, proxy for Secretary Churchill here. Um, we have uh, Jason Debo, proxy for Secretary McCord. We have Director Tung for MEA. Uh, we have Dr. Goodwin for UMSEs. We I see Wayne Stafford, for Farm Bureau. I see Dr. Kirschling. I see David Lapp, People's Council. I see uh, Chair Pinsky, uh, Jesse Eiliff, um, uh, Mike Powell. I see Delegate Stein. Um, Don Butchko as proxy for Administrator Belton. Are there um, first any commissioners who have dialed in? on a phone number if you could un un unmute and announce yourself chris this is david smedic with rmi i'm about to be on my computer but on the phone at the moment excellent thanks so much david and i see yeah chris this is yes sorry chris this is dana stein um for some reason my video wasn't working and so i've called in okay great well sorry but great that you're here Okay, any other commissioners uh, who I missed? Okay, then, uh, Madam Chair, we have a quarum. Uh, Excellent. So you to kick us off with opening remarks. Excellent. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. We're here today at a point of decision making, um, and I look forward to some robust and hopefully somewhat time constrained discussions. I, I want to start today just by um, centering us and restating the charge to the Climate Commission. In 2015, the legislature charged this body to advise the governor and the General Assembly on ways to mitigate the causes and adapt to the consequences of climate change. And just last year in 2022, the Climate Solutions Now Act charged this body, charged you, commissioners, with developing proposals that allow the state to reach a 60% reduction by 2031 and a net zero goal reduction by 2045. The governor requires us to center economic viability and jobs in our decision-making. And Dr. Goodwin, science is a core value of this state. And uh, so considering existing knowledge while we exam examine innovative and credible tools has also been a key directive in influencing our decision-making as a commission. Um, I wanna acknowledge again today that we recognize the historic and systemic racism that has made some of our Maryland communities more vulnerable to climate impacts like flooding, heat, storms, disease, and lack of affordability. Um, this too must be a key aspect of our decision making. And thanks to Charmaine, we have been able to use the lens of equity to evaluate these recommendations. Our goal today is to set forth key recommendations that keep the path to 60 by 31 and, 20, and net zero by 2045 achievable. Our recommendations can be both specific and some will be more general. They may involve different parts of our government, some independent parts of our government, like local governments. They need not be perfectly vetted with each of the impacted agencies or affected governments because they were developed by volunteers with an ambitious charge. These recommendations are intended to keep Maryland in its global leadership position. They are preparing us for a vibrant future that is less dependent on greenhouse gas fuels. 
to warm us or to cool us and to help us to find communities that thrive surrounded by nature. And we're gonna do this with equity as, I sent, as a center. So I expect thoughtful debate, and I hope that we will sift aspiration from achievability while I simultaneously recognize that aspiration can and will drive achievable outcomes. But I want to start by thanking our working group chairs. Kim Coble, Mike Powell, I've got to start with you after you went through a grueling nine hours of debate and deliberation to bring forward the mitigation working group recommendations. Charmaine Brown, I want to thank Charmaine for her um, steadfast commitment to center equity in decision making and to guide this body. In, in considering equity in all aspects of its work. Dr. Peter Goodwin, I wanna thank you for the sense of urgency that you convey because of the frequent um, review of our IPCC reports, but also the sense of opportunity that you convey as you bring forward new science that outlines new ways to address these challenging goals that we have. Secretary Hadaway Riccio, I want to thank you and um, the Adaptation and Resiliency Working Group because you've proposed safer, greener, and bluer communities. And that's something that we can all come together to work towards. I want to thank uh, Jody Kowser and Amy Lambert and welcome Jabari Wal Walker of our ECOS group for helping us to learn how to communicate effectively the challenging goals that we have and the specific role that this commission has in our broader state goals. So with those thanks, I know Chris, you need every minute that you have today. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chair Dorsey. So today our agenda starts with public comment and then we will spend the remainder of the time uh, discussing the recommendations that have been advanced by the working groups. Uh, we had set aside 10 minutes for public comment uh, in the agenda. We already have seven people signed up. So uh, Chair Dorsey, I propose we extend the public comment period to at least 15 minutes so that each commenter can have at least two minutes. With That's fine, two permission. minutes. Okay, um, so apologies to everyone. Two minutes is not that much time, but we have a lot to get to and a lot of people who need to speak. So. Um, uh, if you have not yet signed up for public comment and you would like to, please type your name in the, in the chat box and we'll add you to the list. Um, after we get to public comment, uh, we will open with some housekeeping and process notes at MDE and then we'll dive into the, uh, the recommendations. Um, so first, uh, for public comment, we had uh, Marion Eddy. I see you, you're still on mute. There's the microphone button on the bottom of your screen. Now, can yep. you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, um, yes. Um, I'm strongly gonna urge you to reject recommendations 19 and 20 to expand the definition of RPS credits and create new subsidies for woody biomass. To promote the burning of Maryland's forests for energy is a terrible idea. You are turning a carbon sink into a carbon emitter. Four independent scientific studies have concluded that forest biomass has higher greenhouse gas emissions than fossil fuels, partly because fossil fuels are denser and more efficient, so emit less carbon per unit of energy produced when burned. These recommendations are hedged with language meant to reassure, saying in 19 that qualifying biomass should either show carbon benefits or be endorsed as part of a sustainable forest management plan. I wanna point out that you don't have to do both. That's an either or phrase there. This is a little like putting lipstick on a pig, especially if the implementation is done largely by the forest products industry itself. They have many ways to cook the books. For one, they pretend that woody biomass is carbon neutral because they plant new trees to replace the old but it takes 40 or 50 years for a new tree to suck up as much carbon as the old tree released when it was burned. We don't have that kind of time. 
to the industry, sustainable simply means profitable long term. They want to destroy diverse natural forests and replace them with fast growing monoculture plantations. That's a disaster, not only for wildlife and biodiversity, but also bad for climate because the old trees sequester carbon more efficiently than the young ones. Please don't go down this rabbit hole. Don't promote an energy source which is inherently bad, where you have to constantly monitor, measure, and play complicated regulatory games with an industry which will probably play much more attention than you do. Marion, I'm so sorry to interrupt if you wouldn't mind concluding short on time. Uh, I'm done, right? Oh, if you, yeah, if you wouldn't mind concluding, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm just going to say, so please say no to these recommendations and instead invest the tax and ratepayer money on the energy options, which we know are good, solar, wind, and conservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry to everyone to keep you to time. Uh, we are very short. I was, I was grateful to have a minute and a half. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Mark Case is next. Yes, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the chance to uh, provide brief comments. Uh, I want to say at the outset that BGE is fully supportive of Maryland's ambitious goals for decarbonization. We expect and are planning to play a significant role in facilitating that transition. We're also supportive of electrification. We see it as a foundational element, but not the only element of any pathway to achieving net zero. BGE engaged E3 over the past year to build on the prior work that they did for the Climate Commission and to do a deeper analysis of the BGE service territory so that we could best understand the implications for our customers and how to partner with the state. E3 released its latest work on October 7th, and at the same time, BGE released a paper outlining our vision on how we could support Maryland. E3 examined three pathways for decarbonization and very closely followed the work they did for the state. Their key finding is that a pathway that relies nearly exclusively on electrification will be the most expensive, the most disruptive, the least constructible, and the highest risk of the potential options. Their modeling shows that the peak electric demand in our territory would approximately triple in 20 years under a full electrification scenario. That not only means more infrastructure for transmission and distribution, but it means tripling the amount of renewable resources to meet the clean requirements. For BGE, it would mean 250 new or expanded substations and 1,700 new electric feeders. That's more than double than what we, than what we have in place today. And the ability to site and permit that much infrastructure in Maryland's heavily developed central region is beyond challenging. Uh, it is implausible, even if we were willing to deal with the enormous costs. In contrast, E3 found that the integrated pathways, those that rely on both electric and gas delivery systems, are much more affordable for customers and more realistic in our ability to achieve those pathways. And we would invite all members of the Climate Commission to review E3's work. Under the integrated pathways, we'll still be aggressively pursuing electrification. We'll need about 1 million new heat pumps installed in BGE's territory alone over the next 20 years. Many of those we envision to be hybrid heat pumps where gas is still available to cover the days and the hours where temperatures get so low that a heat pump can no longer meet the load. Thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm so sorry we're out of time. If you could quickly conclude. Yep. I'll just say in summary, we're fully supportive of Maryland's goals. All of those pathways envision that the stride work will be completed. Uh, that's in all of E3's modeling. And so we, it's paramount to us that we choose a pathway that is least, uh, that is the most affordable for our customers and takes into account those risks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next, Josh Tolkien. Sorry, Josh, it's two minutes after 1.15. Hope we can still receive still here. Thank you very much. Thank Hi, you. everybody. Josh Tolkien. I'm the director of the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club. Thank you for the time to make these comments. Uh, first, we just want to I strongly endorse um, several of the recommendations. Recommendation number two on the Clean Cars 2 standard, recommendation four, the advanced clean truck rule, and uh, especially B and C on recommendation number 11, making the community solar program permanent um, and providing incentives for development of solar on preferred sites, both of which will help us 
accelerate uh, solar deployment, which is critical to um, moving us towards our climate goals. We urge the commission to add um, several items, which I think are conspicuously absent from the MWG recommendations. Uh, the first is to urge Maryland to adopt the heavy duty NOx omnibus regulations that will help us reduce uh, pollution from automobiles. And um, this is an item that I'm hoping will be given uh, time for consideration and discussion later in the meeting. Um, I also believe that the commission is missing an opportunity to reinforce several key um, recommendations from 2021. Uh, Item uh, number two, uh, B, C, and D. Last year, you encouraged fuel switching in Empower beginning in 2024. You encouraged beneficial electrification through Empower beginning in 2024 and targeting 50% of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and water heater sales to be heat pumps by 2025. Um, the mitigation working group has recommended some provisions related to the future of Empower, but these same recommendations that you made last year are missing from what has been brought forward. It's That would be a real lost opportunity. If there's going to be amendments to Empower this year, if we want these changes to be made by 2024, they would need to be included in a legislative package that might be considered this coming year. So I would strongly urge the, uh, the commission to amend either those same recommendations or review um, some of the proposals to the mitigation working group that propose how to bring last year's recommendations um, into part of the package being put forward. I further will say that we do have some questions and concerns regarding some of the modeling assumptions uh, that went into the BGE model. We're hoping to sit down and talk with them separately about that, but I believe that the mitigation working group looked into this issue extensively and uh, we urge them to trust the research and recommendations that led you to your uh, work last year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that comment. Uh, next is Colby Ferguson. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll be short and brief. I just want to comment on, um, on recommendation number 14, uh, subsection A. Uh, this is the one talking about the uh, solar installations. And very specifically, there is a sentence in there um, as someone that sits on the uh, mitigation working group, uh, we kind of tried to work on this, but we spent nine hours on a hundred and something uh, recommendations to narrow it down to what we had and maybe didn't give this the, the thoroughness that it needed. Uh, the, the sentence says the county should take into account soil classification. Um, that really doesn't mean anything. So um, we would like to see that specified into what that means, what, which would be to add uh, with a priority on class three soils or lower. Doesn't require it to be, but a priority that be put that the counties target that. It's already being done by Montgomery County, um, Washington County, Talbot County, uh, and several other uh, rural counties are looking at that as well. And our hope is, is that we can preserve our best quality soils, those class one and two soils um, for food production and then utilize those more marginal soils that perfectly are fine for putting in solar panels um, when we need a very small amount of land it'd be nice to uh, target the the poor quality soils uh, in our ag lands so with that uh, thanks for the time thanks so much colby um next on the list brian ditzler thank you uh, i'm uh, speaking uh, in support of recommendation four for the advanced clean truck rule. Uh, trucks in large, uh, as you all know, uh, transportation is responsible for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in our state. Uh, and to that end, um, as large as that is, while trucks and other vehicles account for only 9% of the vehicles on the road, they actually um, contribute 21% of the carbon emissions 48 percent of particulate matter and 39 percent of nitrogen oxide emissions in 2021 this proposal was modeled by mde as a critical tool to meet even 50 percent reductions by 2030 if the state does not pass these regulations it misses out on millions of tons of emission reductions targeting medium and heavy duty emissions through the adoption of, of the advanced clean truck rule 
is the most comp comprehensive way to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. For those people who are concerned that there's not uh, that we're moving too fast and there isn't enough grid capacity to be able to handle things like this, uh, I, I should emphasize that this proposal is for a phase in up to 2035. And in 2024, it only calls for 5% of the sales to be zero emission. In 2026, it's only 10%. So it's gradual phased in. This, this proposal makes sense. And I encourage the commission to retain recommendation four in your final recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And a programming note, as we merge the working group recommendations, MWG recommendation four is now commission recommendation seven. Uh, we'll have some stuff up on the screen to help everybody keep track. Um, uh, next, uh, Jennifer Kunz. Yes, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Kunze with Clean Water Action, and we're commenting today uh, about what is recommendation 19, although I suppose that may be changing, uh, which includes expanding the definition of qualifying biomass in the RPS. Uh, currently, the definition focuses on wood waste materials, and we're concerned about adding line C. Uh, this recommendation would move our RPS in the wrong direction, making it dirtier and more polluting and a less effective tool for driving climate action in the state. The EPA sh records show that many of the wood biomass facilities that we are already subsidizing have poor environmental compliance records. For example, the Novec biomass facility in South Boston, Virginia, currently is listed as being in high priority violation compliance status with the EPA today. Uh, Virginia smartly decided that this facility is not renewable energy. The Virginia Clean Economy Act, which was passed in 2020, explicitly excludes biomass facilities like Novex from qualifying as our renewable under their RPS. However, Maryland does allow this facility to qualify and the facility as a result has profited uh, $26 million uh, between four, 2014 and 2020, paid for by Maryland ratepayers. Expanding the definition of qualifying biomass to allow for more wood burning would be out of step with progress other states are making in this issue. Earlier this year, Massachusetts removed woody biomass from its RPS following the demands of climate and environmental justice activists. This is an environmental justice issue. Like trash incineration, wood biomass facilities emit pollutants that harm the health of nearby communities. A recent Harvard School of Public Health review found that biomass and wood are responsible for the fastest growing share of early deaths among the major energy consuming sectors in the country. Expanding woody biomass would also be a bad deal for the climate. Just because wood is removed from a forest as part of what's classified as a climate friendly forest, forest management action, it does not follow at all that then burning that wood uh, is beneficial for the climate, especially when by including it in the RPS, that displaces subsidies that ought to be going to wind and solar and other truly renewable energy by taking up RECs. So uh, we hope that the commission isn't going to recommend this expansion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, next, Diane Younce. You're still on mute. Sorry, it went back on mute. Um, um, I would like to second Jennifer Kunze's comments, um, recommending that we do not allow expanding the definition, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold, of woody biomass in the RPS, because it does move the RPS in the wrong direction. And whatever safeguards you think you've put in the language, um, we know that the only way it's going to get into the RPS is through a legislative process, and that's just going to invite um, mischief. Um, the proponents of putting woody biomass into expanding the definition of woody biomass in the RPS was um, um, proposed in 2021. It didn't have any of the supposed safeguards that are on this, but the proponents of woody biomass in, in the RPS um, supported that bill with no kinds of safeguards they don't care about the safeguards um and um we also know that just by expanding the rps to include dirty energy sources just just invites the legislature to further expand um the rps to invite other dirty sources into the rps 
Um, the example of black liquor is a good lesson. The only reason we were able to succeed in finally getting that back out of the RPS is that there were no longer any jobs being provided in Maryland for uh, uh, those facilities that produce black liquor because the last facility in Maryland closed down. Um, the legislature has a bad habit of looking at the RPS as a jobs bill and we really should not, the Maryland Commission on Climate Change should not be encouraging that and giving its blessing to um, expanding the RPS to include dirty sources. Thank you. Thank you very Excuse much. Me. Yeah, welcome Treasurer Davis. Thank you. Um, as a former legislator and the chair of the committee that did that dirty legislation, I, I think the body has, this commission has to keep in mind that the legislature has a dual responsibility. It does not operate in a vacuum, or at least when I was there and running economic matters, um, we had a dual responsibility to ensure both the, the, the health of our, of our climate, as well as sources that we were doing to, to keep electricity and energy affordable that they have a dual responsibility. It can't just operate in a vacuum. So what I'm saying is that as we're discussing this, we need to keep that in mind. And, and as long as I got the floor, um, I noticed I was looking at a number of the recommendations and of the 29 and probably 20 plus essentially said, add more money, add more money um, to this or, or that we can do that and i guess we don't really need to concern ourselves with the money but they do so if we're really looking to if we're just sort of operating aspirationally and putting stuff out there then i will remain quiet but if we're looking at things that they're actually going to do we can't keep saying throw money at it because there isn't an endless supply of money um with all the varied needs uh 30 million for this 5 million for that tax credit for this that's just that's not realistic guys thank you treasurer davis and we have uh number 19 is on the discussion list uh so we'll have full discussion on that uh here shortly we have one more member signed up for public comment uh mike o'halloran mapta hey good afternoon chris thank you so much and uh, apologies i'm unable to uh to be on camera um speaking today on behalf of mapta which is the uh, energy marketers and convenience store association here in maryland um, you know, I, I'll keep it top line and certainly will direct you guys to our written comments for more uh, details. But um, going off the, the commission's draft recommendations, um, you know, number seven, the advanced clean truck. Um, certainly the mitigation working group heard from uh, the Motor Truck Association about some of the challenges that an ACT poses. We uh, agree with those challenges. Those include cost and availability, not only just costs in terms of uh, the product, these these uh, electrified trucks, um, but also the infrastructure readiness, um, not only from a grid standpoint, um, but also uh, from an infrastructure, a, a roads and bridges standpoint. Um, particularly, you know, as as albeit advancements are continuously being made in this uh, field, the fact is a fully electrified uh, tractor is going to weigh. A heck of a lot more than the uh, the diesel operating trucks that we see out there today. Also, number eight, a low carbon fuel standard. Uh, similarly to to a cost concern, there's also a supply concern. Um, you know, as we look to our our partners in the West, in California, Oregon, and Washington, let's keep in mind that Maryland does not have refining operations here in the state. And I'll also paraphrase the Maryland Energy Administration's concern about this, and that this represents a massive shift. Uh, in, in motor fuels, particularly, um, you know, California as it stands, gas is over $6 a, a gallon. Admittedly, a lot of things go into that, um, but that certainly uh, the fact that California has an LCFS plays a large uh, role in that. Um, and broadly speaking, on number 16 and 17, under building carbon decarbonization, um, you know, look, the, the Climate Solutions Now Act um, the, the legislature went through the ringer this past session um, in terms of passing a bill that takes a deeper dive into that. And perhaps similarly, um, you know, some of these uh, six and so, excuse me, seven and eight, um, the fact is working groups are set up that represent a broad, broad 
uh, uh, scope of expertise. Um, that is not to say the mitigation working group and the other working groups don't contain uh, similar expertise, but the fact is uh, the impacted industries in particular are part of these working groups. Uh, so as far as 16 and 17 are concerned, we would certainly hope that the uh, Climate Commission acknowledges the fact that the working groups uh, that have not been constituted yes, will be, yet will be taking uh, some of these issues under consideration. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks. Okay, that concludes public comment. Uh, thanks to all the members of the public who offered comments and thanks to the commission for offering some more time for that on the agenda. So we'll now turn to uh, the, the portion where we're discussing recommendations. So I'm gonna offer some process notes at the top. I'll direct everyone to the materials we sent um, uh, beforehand when we sent out the compilation of recommendations advanced by the working groups. We solicited written uh, amendments, uh, and then we compiled all those amendments in the distribution last night. So that's the document we'll be going through. Um, uh, staff has prepared um, a proposed uh, discussion framework to, in the hopes that we will be able to move um, to make it through. Uh, I'm bringing up uh, my screen here. So to clarify for everyone, this October meeting is the recommendations discussion, the meeting where you all will formally consider the annual report, which contains recommendations, is next month. So this is additional time for the commission to discuss the recommendations. Uh, we're going to go working group by working group. Uh, we have taken all of the recommendations for which there were no written amendments or written uh, comments from commissioners that they'd like to discuss them, and we have put all of those on a consent calendar for each working group with the hope that we can seek consensus uh, on those ones all at once, uh, and so we can reserve as much time as possible to discuss uh, the recommendations that commissioners have flagged for amendments and discussion. Now, note, since we're looking for consensus on that, any commissioner can say, I want that one off the consent calendar, right? Uh, so hopefully we can uh, proceed expeditiously that way. Then we'll go one by one through the remaining recommendations uh, and we'll consider amendments. We'll entertain motions to amend, motions to approve, and we will be looking for simply a simple majority vote uh, uh, to approve that recommendation, finding its way onto the draft report. That is not the commission's final endorsement of that recommendation. That is simply a process step to move it under the draft report that you all will be considering uh, next month. Uh, next month, we will seek, as always, consensus on the report and all the recommendations as a whole, understanding that many of us individually may not like every single item that's on the list in the final report or like that some items are not on the list. But we hope, as always, everyone can consider the package as a whole and we can find consensus. This process will give everyone an opportunity to weigh in on individual recommendations. Uh, and for example, get on the record, perhaps if you oppose one of them, and then next month you can consider the package as a whole as usual. Is there any, any questions or discussion from uh, commissioners? I see, yes, Chairman Pinsky. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I did have some procedural questions. Sure. Um, one thing I've been thinking about, and I think one of our speakers during public testimony raised, are recommendations that were made last year um, that are not included this time. And, and I guess my question is, are we assuming they're in or they're out? For example, um, when E3 worked for the commission and the state, they came up with a proposal for electrification and building reduction. Uh, also in last year's recommendation, there was a recommendation for fuel switching to allow um, not just uh, cleaner HVAC systems, but shifting to heat pumps none of those are included as default recommendations so i guess my question is procedurally how do we view those um you know despite what mr case and bg &E said they've now hired uh e3 with a new report with different assumptions but when e3 was hired by the state they made recommendations to us and we made subsequent recommendations last year so i'm trying to understand those recommendations we made last year uh, are they in or are they out? We have two hands from uh, David Lapp and, and Mike Powell. I wonder if either of you have, have thoughts on that question of how do we treat recommendations from last year? Yeah, I, I would say yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I was um, going to raise the same issue. I'm very concerned about that because these 
uh, these issues, um, recommendations, and other related recommendations never got discussed within the uh, mitigation working group. It ran out of time. Uh, proposals that um, I had uh, recommended back in May and was hoping to present on within the mitigation working group never got um, never got an airing, um, never got discussion, never got specifically voted on. Um, and I'm concerned, especially with the ones there's gas transition planning, fuel fuel switching, uh, incentives for gas appliances that were previous year's recommendations. Aside aside from new ones, that uh, if they aren't part of the process this year, it looks like the Climate Commission is taking a step backwards from previous years, um, even though the General Assembly has just passed uh, more aggressive climate goals. So uh, we would like to see the previous year's recommendations included, um, uh, except if they're not superseded by other ones. So we think they should be incorporated um, into this year's report if they have not been superseded by other recommendations that are going to be voted on. If I can comment, Chris, as, as co-chair, um, there was no deliberate decision to either exclude or include any of last year's recommendations. Um, we were focused upon new recommendations. Um, I do think, David, some of yours were voted on in, uh, in writing, but uh, in terms of holdover recommendations from last year, the mitigation working group did not consider whether they should be re-included or not. There was no decision to omit them nor a decision to add them. To, to be clear, my recommendations were never discussed. I, I didn't get the opportunity to present. There was no discussion whatsoever. I spent hours in the calls. I'm not, I understand it was a challenging process and I'm not this is not to disparage efforts of anybody involved, but I'm, I'm very concerned that we are going to send, the commission is going to send a message that we're backtracking from previous year's recommendations when they never got considered by the NWG. There was no, uh, no discussion of those. And so I, I think they should be um, incorporated to the extent that they aren't superseded. Um, at the very least, we need strong language to say that just because they aren't in this year does not mean that the commission uh, is disapproving them in any way. But we think they should be incorporated. I, I think I think we can make that statement, right? I think we can make that statement that, you know, unless new recommendations supersede, that the old recommendations stand. Um, you know, I think the charge was 60 by 31, and what big things do we need to focus on to achieve that? In no way does that take away from what was what went on previously. So I want to be clear about that. I think we can do that, David, with a statement in the. Yeah, I, um, I appreciate that. That would that would be very helpful. I mean, we 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 also we just missed the boat. I mean, we're we're talking on on the natural gas issue. We didn't address any of the building natural gas issues. We That's have tens, true. tens of billions, tens, you may want to wait until we uh, get hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if I can if I can just one comment. I mean, I'm troubled by the fact that we have tens of billions and even more than a hundred billion dollars being spent and being committed to as we speak. Uh, that is locked in for the future on natural gas and we never got a chance to address that within the mitigation working group um so that's aside from uh you know the ones that weren't there last year so i i hope um i want i would like to uh, after this I, I know it's challenging right now and i'm not i don't want to be you know a roadblock moving forward but i know i would like to understand better going forward how the processes um, that the commission undertakes. Um, because last year I was in the same position as I am right now, where I, last year I presented some, um, some recommendations and modifications, and they were not, uh, one of the arguments against them was that they weren't addressed within the working group. And here I am again in the same situation. 
Thank you. We we have those proposals on the table for the mitigation working group proposals. So for the mitigation working group section, mm -hmm. so we can we'll, we can discuss them uh, again here shortly. Uh, yeah, Chairman, you. Is, yeah, and thank you. Yeah. I, I, just, I just want to be clear on uh, Deputy Secretary Dorsey's comment, which I, I think I agree with. So any proposals that were in last year's report um, will be included as default recommendations in this report. Is that what I heard from uh, Ms. Dorsey? I, I think, um, Chair Pinsky, what I was suggesting is that we um, include by statement that all of the recommendations in last year's report stand and that these, uh, unless they're superseded by ex additional, you know, the new recommendations and that these build upon those recommendations. Is that satisfying? Uh, generally, you know, I, I hate to be two steps removed and say if they're superseded, that could be in someone's interpretation. So I, 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 I yeah. think that, you know, either we, list them, either we list them or we say all recommendations from the 21-22 report are included. Uh, and then as we get to a final vote next week, if we have to, if right. there's something that, that may supersede them, then we should talk about that issue by issue. I, that, I just that makes very sense. Explicit. I, 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 you know, the point that was made that uh, the Climate Solutions Bill, which I had a, a part in playing, um, did take a major step forward. And I don't want it to be seen to the public that we're backtracking. Uh, and I thought last year's report was very solid and very strong. And I know there are probably some people on the call who don't like it or disagree with it. And that's why they want subsequent studies. Um, so I, I just want to be very explicit that the agreements we uh, adopted last year, that this commission is not backtracking given the charge from the legislature and the governor. Uh, understood. And again, I, I, I'm uh, concerned about timing today, so may I suggest that the um, the staff will work on writing and share that broadly uh, to to build consensus on the exact verbiage around that, just in so that we can move forward and, and get some votes today. That, that's yep. fine. Great, excellent. Staff will do that. We have a hand up from uh, Commissioner David Smedic. Thanks, Chris. Uh, not to keep that conversation going too much longer, I believe that last year we included as an appendix um, the previous year's set of recommendations and some language that was just being discussed. So um, it, it had the, the full list of recommendations from the previous year that hadn't already been adopted by the General Assembly or the agencies was included as an appendix, and that could be a model we follow again. Great. All right, thank you. That's all very helpful uh, to clarify where we stand. So uh, we'll now move to the discussions of the working group's recommendations. Um, so for each of the working groups, we prepared, as I was uh, uh, mentioning before, sort of the list of recommendations for which there's no discussion or recommendations off or amendments offered and the list for which there were proposed amendments. Uh, in the case of ARWG, there was one uh, there's one proposed recommendation and we do have amendments. So I'm going to bring that up on the screen and, and we will discuss. Um, and uh, we'll start uh, with each of these uh, asking the working group co-chairs uh, if they'd like to present uh, any context or overview of the working group's uh, recommendations. Um, if I can just comment on the process um, that the mitigation working group followed, and maybe, uh, Kim, you can... I want, yeah, and I wonder, Mike, since we're starting with ARWG, could, could we... Absolutely, if you want to wait. In that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So starting with ARWG, we have the recommendation here with some proposed uh, wording amendments. Uh, if we have Secretary Hadaway Riccio, um, if you'd like to offer any context about the ARWG's work this year. Um, and sure. your yeah. the proposed amendments, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, all of the commission members have seen the draft Maryland Climate Adaptation and Resilience Framework recommendations that were developed through the facilitated process that University of Virginia Institute for Engagement and Negotiation um, developed. And so this recommendation essentially takes us 
uh, in next steps to develop the next generation adaptation plan for the state of Maryland, um, essentially a 10 year roadmap to resilience. And it would be using that menu of resilience strategies that were identified in the framework. Uh, so we were very intentional in our recommendation here that there be collaboration between the partners and the state agencies, um, that there be accountability by assigning specific deliverables to those um, departments and agencies, that we report on our progress to the commission to ensure that the commission is adequately engaged, and that we also establish a tracking system so that we can measure progress and um, track our progress along the way. Um, so that's bas the basic overview, and I know Christine Kahn is on, if Christine would like to add anything. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, you, you covered it well. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we have a proposed amendment. So uh, Madam Secretary, I don't know if you, have, if you have thoughts to offer on whether to consider this a friendly amendment and your, your advice on accepting it uh, or not. Yeah, so I view these amendments mainly as technical and clarifying in nature, and I think they do encapsulate the intention of our working group. So, um, you know, speaking for myself, I, I, I see these as friendly amendments. Okay, so uh, I, I suggest, uh, Madam Chair, if we entertain a motion to uh, accept the amendments uh, and approve this recommendation for inclusion in the draft report as amended on the screen. So move. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So the way we'll handle voting is by uh, typing into the chat box. So if everyone could type yay, nay, or abstain, and climate program staff is on hand to tally uh, the votes. Okay, the yeses have it, um, and we'll pro provide the final vote tally in the chat. Thank you all very much. So um, we will now switch, move on to uh, ECO. Um, so ECO, likewise, um, amendments to consider for um, their two recommendations. Um, with no items on the consent calendar. So I'll bring up those recommendations while um, if our co-chairs for ECO would like to offer any thoughts on ECO's process and um, the recommendations that it led to. Thanks, Chris. Um, ECO is offering two recommendations this year. The first is, it looks like the, just some simple clarification in the wording, which should be fine, but basically focusing on using language that it is more understandable to the general public. Um, the second um, is more towards funding and advertising campaign, a true PR campaign statewide. Um, and notice that the funding dollar value is, has been removed. I am concerned a little bit about that in that um, I think that removing the dollar value had, creates an opportunity for this to be significantly underfunded to the to the point where it could possibly not achieve its goals. Um, and there's a question in there about who would oversee the campaign. Um, our pr proposal would be that the campaign would be overseen by the Eco Working Group, but using um, consultants that we would bring on, chances are um, we would strive to bring on a minority or women-owned web developer and PR firm, Maryland-based. Okay, so why don't we take these one by one? It sounds like, if I heard you right, you would consider uh, the uh, proposed amendments number two as, as friendly, and it, it's, it's certainly accepted by the chairs. So I think we can entertain a motion to approve uh, uh, number two as amended on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw a so moved from Mike Powell. We have a second. Second. Okay, we have a second. So everyone please vote yes, no, or abstain in the chat on item number two.
Okay. Uh, looks like the yeses have it. We'll, um, the program staff will tally in the chat. So why don't we discuss now number three? Um, uh, I suggest perhaps uh, there was the question. There was the question of the dollar value. Uh, so I wonder if we could lean on uh, Kim Coble, who proposed the amendment, um, to start discussion on that topic. Thank you, Chris. And I want to um, thank the Eco Work Group, who uh, did some great work on these recommendations. And I agree completely with the concepts that are being presented. So there's no disagreement there. Uh, the only reason I am suggesting um, the five million be removed um, uh, is that I feel that this recommendation should go forward, period, and that it shouldn't be contingent on five million dollars. Um, and and it's not that it's this recommendation. There are a lot of recommendations that we're putting forward that. Um, need funds as treasurer uh, davis said so I i'm concerned that in one recommendation we're saying this needs five million dollars and in other recommendations we're saying it just needs funding and so in a collective manner i thought to just default that um we don't mention specific dollar amounts so in concept absolutely agree with the recommendation Okay, so uh, Amy, as co-chair, would you would you consider this uh, friendly amendment? We could entertain motions, or do you think we should continue to discuss? Um, I I completely understand where Kim is coming from. It, assuming that we're going to go through the whole report and remove all the, the funding dollar values, um, then I would consider it a friendly recommendation. Okay, but I would so, say my concern is noted that it could be significantly underfunded. Thank you. All right, so we'll we'll entertain motions to uh, approve this amendment as or approve this recommendation as amended on the screen here. Oh, sorry, Kim. Sorry, if I I, I don't know the process. Um, to respect Amy's concerns, um, maybe it should read: General Assembly should fund and develop a statewide climate awareness campaign. So it's really explicit that we are saying funding. We're just not giving the dollar amount. Thank you. Okay. The General Assembly should fund and develop a statewide uh, campaign. Okay. Are there motions to uh, accept this as amended? I don't want to belabor this, uh, Chris, Amy, yes. and Kim, but do we want to say adequately fund? Um, to sort of address Amy's concern that it could be significantly underfunded. And of course, we could talk about what adequately means, but I think it would give some um, sense that serious consideration would be to the size. Okay, I'm seeing nods. Do we have a motion to accept? Uh, uh, so moved. Okay. Do we have a second? We have second. a second. Okay, so everyone please vote on whether to approve uh, this recommendation for inclusion in the draft report as amended on the screen. Okay. So the yeses have it, and we'll move. To the mitigation working group. Uh, I'll try to zoom in here. Okay, so MWG had a number of recommendations. Uh, so for your, there were all of these listed on the left, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 18, and 20. Uh, we did not, we either did not receive any proposed amendments or in the case of 11 and 20, uh, what were in the judgment of MDE staff, very minor edits. So we're offering that whole list as a consent calendar and we're seeking consensus on that. Uh, if there are any on this list that any commissioner believes should not be on the consent calendar, uh, you can identify it now and we'll move it to the discussion list. 
Quick question. Number 18, that's the one that has to do with methane, correct? Cement CCU task force, CCUS. Uh, that has to do with methane? Yeah. Is that the one under the uh, capitalized and utilized methane from waste management and CO2 heading that was sent over? Oh, yes. It is under that heading, yes. Yeah. So um, I have an amendment in that category. I don't know if it's fully germane to that particular recommendation. How, how would you recommend handling that? Is it germane to a different recommendation? Yeah, one that the working novel? group defeated that has to do with methane. If it wouldn't belong in that recommendation, I, I suggest we either consider it in a different recommendation or offer it as an additional item when we get to additions. OK, cool. Thank you. OK. All right, thanks. So we'll, we'll, we'll note that for follow up. I see a, uh, hands up. Uh, I'm not sure which order they came up. Uh, why don't we start with MEA? Um, I, I understand trying to be um, uh, time conscious here, but um, I, I don't think MEA can um, uh, move forward with this on a consent. Uh, we have comments about some of these, and I, I think we should probably look at each and every one of them. Um, I we I just saw this. I mean, I we weren't able to review this as a consent calendar um, item. So, and I, I'm assuming we're not alone on that um, as as a list together. Um, that could be a problem for us. Okay, thank you. I see hands from other commissioners. Uh, are they on this topic? Uh, the same question that MEA brought up, sort of the list generally. So why don't why don't we discuss that um, uh, chair and co-chairs uh, process item for you all? If we do not treat this as a consent calendar, we discuss each and every one. That's the choice we face uh, yeah. right now. Chris, I and and I just put out for the for consideration that that should we go through each one. Um, it's my estimation that we will not get through all of them. These were put out on Friday um, and we requested input and uh, amendments, which we received for a number of them. Um, again, it is, I, I think it is a consensus calendar. So um, that, that's a reality, but should we not have a significant number of these um, on a consensus calendar, there will be an additional meeting again and that is up to this body to consider yeah i just wanted to remind people that um it took the mitigation work group nine hours to get through this list and the mitigation work group has a lot fewer members than does the commission thanks and although these are these are the items that came out of that nine hour process there were a number of items that did not make it through um, so, uh, we have a process question. We, uh, I guess I'll, I'll suggest from the staff that we could consider this not as, not for consensus, but we could, uh, perhaps take a vote on this, uh, seeking maybe a majority after we hear from the other two hands are up that are up that may be about specific recommendations. That's a thought for the chair and co-chairs to consider for change in the process. Why don't we hear from those two other hands? I believe uh, Wayne uh, Stafford was up first and then Chairman Pinsky. Wayne, if you're talking, you're still on mute. Uh, it didn't work, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, hear you now. I was just gonna have the number seven removed from the consensus. Okay, and Chairman Pinsky? Yeah, very quick question on number four. I know there was a presentation given to the NWG on targeted incentives for some um, trucks that were light duty trucks that give off a lot more uh, in carbon dioxide emissions than others. I think Oregon or Washington is doing that. Uh, is that just implied in four or was there any discussion of with you somehow talking about adding the word targeted incentives. I, again, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I didn't push it as a standalone. I just don't know if that was subsumed by four 
or was an uh, oversight or just a choice not to address it? Four is more general in that target refers to an aspirational statewide target um, of 75% of uh, newly registered light duty vehicles being ZEV by 2030. Um, it, it is not for targeted incentives. I see uh, Mike Powell is off mute. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, Senator, there wasn't a decision not to do that. It was written as more general. So I don't think you could read the language as written as either endorsing or failing to endorse that approach. It was just a more general approach. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, the decision before the body is we have uh, a list of items on the consent calendar. We have at least one commissioner uh, saying there is not consent to treat them as in a batch. So the question for the chair and co-chairs is how to proceed. Should we uh, begin to discuss them one by one, or should we consider them in a uh, absent consensus? Uh, seek a majority. I, I would respectfully disagree uh, with the suggestion that we take them one by one. Uh, that that was the mitigation work group's job, um, and as Mike said, it took a long time to get through it. MEA was participated in much of the discussions um, that we had as well. So I would encourage us to move forward with the consent calendar. I think what I would suggest, something like what Kim is saying, the process you, we used in the mitigation working group with 122 recommendations uh, was that we first um, circulated among people uh, a spreadsheet and said, how close is it? Um, and any recommendation that couldn't get 11 votes, we just weren't going to spend the time on debating it this year. And a proposal that got over 15 votes in writing before we even discussed it, we assumed were likely going to pass. Uh, similarly here, what I might suggest is uh, unless there is going to be a large opposition to a particular issue, it's really not worth spending a lot of time talking about it. People are welcome to submit comments for um, uh, for the record, but um, I, I mean, let's take the most obvious example. Number five, advanced clean cars too, were already required by law to do. And so I'm not sure why we would spend a lot of time talking about something that's already in existing law. Um, so I might suggest that a, a simple vote on the package. We have a suggestion for a simple vote. I, I that means simple majority. Same rule we're going to apply to them individually. Um, I see some nods. Can I uh, just raise as this hands up? Davis. Uh, um, I may be a little confused at this point about what we're saying procedurally. Are we saying that, if I'm understanding correctly, and correct me if I'm not again, are we saying that we're just going to have one vote on the entire package or uh, as a consensus or or i think the request is being to pull individual if, if there is concern to pull individual um recommendations out and vote them one-on-one -on -one. is that am i hearing that correct the reason why i'm asking and i get that this is not a legislative body so it doesn't operate under the same rules but a consensus calendar is just that a consensus by definition if it's not a consensus you have to pull it out and do it one by one you can't call something a consensus calendar and then vote on it senator penske is like with us when we or I keep saying with us when you all when you're doing liquor bills for example if someone has those are generally done by consent calendar but if someone has an objection to something you cannot say that still has to be part of the consent calendar by definition, by the way that works, because it's not a consent. Everybody's not agreeing to that. So it's really not optional or something that you can vote on. It's only if everyone agrees, then you do it. Otherwise, everyone's entitled to have a recorded vote on on whatever item that is that is objectionable. That's how it works. I mean, you can't just say, and I get what you're saying, Mike, about how long it took, but you can't just say we're going to vote on everything regardless it, it, because you only get one vote. It's either yes or no. 
And if they don't feel that way on a given item, you can't make them vote that way. Yeah, no, I, I agree that any item that somebody um, wants to pull out should be pulled out. Yep. Oh. And so the so the suggestion is to change the process. We're no longer considering a consent calendar for the MWG. We instead of we have a batch of unamended recommendations uh, to vote on uh, on mass initially. So move the voting batch four through twenty. Second. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion uh, to vote on all of the batch on the left. Uh, uh, as originally proposed uh, in the materials for today, uh, please type your vote into the chat. Uh, just a clarification, yes, yeah, it, you're voting for the batch. You may not like a particular item, but this is as a batch. Would you agree to the whole uh, kit? Okay. We have a number of votes and the yeses have it uh, with uh, at least one no and a couple of abstentions. Um, so thank you everyone for bearing with us on the process. Um, barring technical di difficulty, Sandy, I guess we'll treat MDOT as an abstention or um, our absence for this particular vote. Hopefully we can work through that. Um, so now we're going to move to the discussion and amendment ones on the list here on the right, uh, starting with number seven. So I'm going to move to that screen. Um, so for each of these, we'll treat them just like we did before. Uh, and, and Chris, I'd like to talk a little bit about the process the sure. mitigation working group followed. Maybe Kim can. Yeah, can thank you. Um, as you saw, we had 122 recommendations on the list for us to consider. Uh, and in, actually, we had far more suggestions than that. But those are the numbers that we eventually came down to. The process we adopted was to first circulate. Well, let, let me back up a minute. Well, we had identified two super priorities. Um, that is that uh, transportation had to be addressed because it's the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions. And we had to do something about the pace of development of renewable energy projects. Because we've only got uh, seven um, utility scale CPCN solar farms built in Maryland. And a lot of the rest of our program uh, assumes a lot of renewable energy. But we didn't confine ourselves to those two. Instead, we tried to develop a priority list from among the 122. So the first thing we did was circulate a spreadsheet among all the mitigation working group members, asking them to indicate which recommendations they felt should be elevated to the priority and then gain a discussion. Um, and uh, it took at least 11 votes to put it on the table. 11 votes were not enough to pass it, but it took at least 11 votes to trigger a discussion. And that's why there were some recommendations that some individuals wanted but it did not receive enough support at that level. Um, when we then convened, we said that any uh, recommendation which had received at least 15 votes, a supermajority in the um, uh, in the written discussion, was basically considered to be likely to be approved, and we had a, a vote on those as a batch. We then went through the remaining recommendations, which were considerably more than the ones you have on your list. When we moved a recommendation from the priority list to the additional recommendation area, it was not necessarily a, uh, a pose for all time. It was that um, the consensus of the mitigation working group was that it should not be within our priority recommendations this year. In many cases, there were discussions that those are items we should consider over the next year. So the remaining items on that 122 list, the additional recommendations, will definitely be potential recommendations for last year. And then as I think we discussed earlier, 
we did not reconsider any prior recommendations from earlier years, so there was no intent to retract a recommendation. We were instead reacting to the fact that instead of, as we were last year, trying to get a 50% reduction by 2030, our goal now was 60% by 2031, and therefore what additional recommendations we would need to add to meet to that tougher goal. Uh, Kim, did I fairly describe it? Yes. Thanks, Mike. So uh, let's turn to the individual ones. Uh, we had a request uh, to discuss number seven, advanced clean trucks. I believe that request came from Wayne. Wayne, would you like to offer any discussion on this to start us off? If I'm recalling that right. Yeah, I'll, I apologize. My internet is slowly freezing up on me again. I don't know if you can hear me now or not. Yep, we can hear you. I was just opposed to this because of the large trucks. We have no, especially the expense of them, but the, the infrastructure needed it for the large trucks is just nowhere near what we would need to even support this. Uh, Number seven. Okay, we have a hand up from Chairman Pinsky. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chris. I want to reinforce what my, Michael Powell just talked about that um, transportation is a major, major problem, the, the leading problem, that and uh, building energy far and outweigh anything else that we have to do. And I think we've passed the low hanging fruit. You know, this reminds me of the clean car bill. California took the lead and then four or five states followed behind it. And we know California is the biggest purchaser of, of cars in the, in the country in, the, in much of the world. Um, and we already have five or eight other states, some of them in the middle Atlantic state. So I think we have to participate, join that momentum. And I think with that much purchasing power, uh, the industry will make the changes that are necessary. We, we can't lay back and hope for the best. Uh, as a number of people have said, we're now pushing 60%, not 50%. So I think we have to make some tough choices. Other large, much larger states have taken the lead. And I think putting Maryland uh, in the same posture is the way we should go. So I would encourage us to uh, retain number seven. Thank you, Chairman Finsky. We have hands from uh, MEA, uh, Kim Koble, uh, and David Smedic. So Director Tung. Uh, yeah, my first question is, does M MDE have um, the ability to adopt a rule on their own like this? I, I'm just asking, I, I really don't know. Yes, this is a, uh, a vehicle emissions regulation under the Clean Air Act, uh, Section 177. <clears throat> so MDE would have the authority to adopt it. Okay, because that, that's a, a major um, issue. Uh, secondly, we're just such a small state. Um, you know, I, I get trying to get um, put goals out there, but people are just going to go across the line and, and buy it elsewhere. Um, it's, I mean, it's Pennsylvania and West Virginia and um, Virginia going to adopt this. It just seems like it put Maryland at a disadvantage, Maryland businesses at a disadvantage. I mean, we've been, you know, MEA's got programs to, um, you know, advance clean trucks and we've been doing it for years, so we don't have a problem with that, but I'm just wondering, uh, this particular rule seems like it would be a problem since we are such a small state. Thank you. Uh, next is Kim Coble. Thank you, Chris. Um, a couple other things. Uh, it, since this has been drafted, um, New Jer or excuse me, North Carolina has also signed on. So the states are coming on to this pretty rapidly. Uh, so I, I and and this rule is a phase in. It's not an immediate. It's over a, a, a number of years that it will be implemented. So there, there'll be time for an adjustment. And the last point I want to make is that, as uh, Senator Pinsky pointed out, transportation is the largest source. Uh, these uh, heavy duty trucks, diesel burning trucks, are uh, a leading source. And here's the important part. It's the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions and um, expected to exceed passenger 
vehicle emissions by 2030. So if we're serious about our goals, then we have to include this recommendation. Thank you, Kim Cobles. We'll do Dave Smedic, then Wayne Stafford and Mike Powell, and I suggest to the group we call the question soon. Uh, David? Thanks, Chris, uh, and thank you uh, for the opportunity quick to chime in on this. Um, I, I want to second a lot of what Kim and Senator Pinsky uh, just mentioned. I think this is a really critical recommendation. Uh, we've heard from a lot of uh, public groups as well through a variety of means, uh, both the commission and, and the agency have heard the importance of this. The, the only other thing that I'll add uh, in speaking in favor of this recommendation is the uh, commission and, and MDE, I, I want to say it was almost two years ago, got uh, some additional analysis uh, provided them about the importance of um, zeroing out emissions or, or lower, significantly lowering emissions from the medium and heavy duty sector. And it was one of the top five critical things that we need to be doing to achieve our climate goals. And that was before the Climate Solutions Now Act passed. And the Advanced Clean Truck Rule is one of the most important and, and most tangible uh, policy recommendations that I think we can advance to help achieve that goal. That's one of the most critical to to get to meeting our overall climate goals. So I do uh, think we need to keep this one as a full commission in here. It puts us on uh, the pages being really serious about that growing piece of uh, factor of emissions that Kim mentioned. Thank, Thank you. you. David. Wayne? Yeah, <laughs> once again, I apologize because my Thing keeps freezing up, but I've missed part of the discussion. But I just wanted to reiterate that the recommendation doesn't go far enough on the infrastructure requirements. And we do not oppose clean cars. The clean truck rule just, we're not ready for it yet. The vehicles and expense of converting that to it, especially when you go to a bunch of large trucks and what it's going to take. I go back to BG&E's comments of what it would take to recharge it. the electric facilities are just not ready. Thank you, Wayne. And, and Mike Powell, and then I think we have Russ Dickerson as well. Yeah, I just, um, I left out of the introduction, but I intended to say, just in the in the interest of, of a accurate reporting, uh, the, the clean car rules that were in the consent calendar passed by large consensus of the mitigation working group. Uh, the advanced clean truck rule was a closer vote. There were 10 in favor, eight opposed, and two abstentions. So it did pass, but it was a, a closer question, if you will. Thanks, Mike. Dr. Dickerson? And I, I do reiterate to the group that in the interest of time, we should call the question here shortly. Dr. Dickerson? <laughs> Why do you always say, uh, remind me to be quick? Uh, <laughs> uh, let me point out that there are co-benefits to this because diesel trucks are a major source of NOx and black carbon. Black carbon is a greenhouse substance. These species play a major role in air quality and especially in environmental justice. That's all. Thank you. And so we have a hand from uh, Deputy Secretary Lewis. Glad to see you work through the technical challenges. If you're able to speak. We see you and you. Oh, I'm sorry, Earl. We can't hear you. If, if Deputy Secretary Lewis can't um, speak, I, I do want to invite him to keep trying, but I would like to call the vote, Chris. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion to uh, accept this recommendation for inclusion in the draft report as written on the screen? So move. So we have a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Everyone, please vote in the chat box, yes, no, or abstain on recommendation number seven. Earl, can you keep trying to talk since we're voting? Okay, uh, the yeses have it. So this will be included in the draft report for the commission's consideration. We'll post the final vote tally in the chat. Uh, the next uh, item on the discussion list is number 13. Um, we had a proposed amendment uh, from the Department of Planning. This is 
the recommendation to require recertification of locally designated priority funding areas and transit oriented development areas based on general plan zoning, existing land use, uh, uh, development capacities, alignment yep. to accommodate future population employment projections. So um, I'd open to uh, MDP. I think I saw Secretary McCord, but we have Jason DeBow available as proxy to introduce. The also, this is Earl. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, Earl. Yeah, the, the only comment I was going to make on the last vote is that it says should coordinate. The, the recommendation should say must coordinate because the, the, the truck network between various ports and commerce um, requires all the states to basically have access to the same technology. So, yes, we should all move ahead aggressively with this, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be successful moving aggressively or faster or slower throughout across the whole region because everybody gets their trucks from the same manufacturer. So rather than say should coordinate, I think we're, we'd be at the greatest risk if we didn't coordinate. That's why I say it should have said must rather than should. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll include that as a potential friendly amendment to consider um, uh, uh, in between now and the next thanks. meeting. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. Um, so for 13, uh, do we have Department yes, of- Secretary, Secretary McCord's here first, thanks. Thank you, Secretary McCord. Uh, just my comment here is the PFAs are generally a local decision because we're dealing with now, the program's been in for a while, they extend and expand the PFAs, generally where the water and sewer is located, where housing is located, and um, it, it it just seems that um, that's not the place for um, getting them recertified by, I guess that would be MDP. Um, it, we have to review everything that comes through for extensions of the PFAs. Extensions of the PFAs usually happen with annexations when a new section of the county now becomes a section of a municipality. And um, we review and comment on that. And um, at, at the moment, um, our latest, run of the jurisdictions from 2013 to 2021, 83.7% of the compact parcels are inside the PFAs. So um, it's not like we're doing poorly in that area. And uh, I think uh, requiring the PFAs to be part of um, recertification process, I think that's imposing some things from the state down to the locals that um, is a burden that they don't need. And we already deal with extension of the PFAs. And I don't think we've ever denied extension of the PFA as long as um, this been justified. We want to make sure that the PFA includes um, the water and sewer areas or um, extending to, uh, you know, business industry and also for all the housing that happens there. We prefer that to happen there, the housing um, for those businesses to happen there instead of um, in a place where there's this um, well and septic. So, um, I, I'm not really sure that uh, I don't understand why that would have to be recertified. The TOD, we're a part of working with MDOT to make sure that we're incentivizing the TOD. We think that's important. And uh, we think that um, um, keeping the TOD certifications in is very important. But um, uh, the PFA itself is, in my mind, more of a local decision that we will um, work with locals to adjust if we need to, but um, we review and confirm those um, as annexations happen. That's the majority of what happens with the PFAs right now. So just want to let you know that I'm not uh, not in favor of uh, um, recertification of locally designated priority funding areas. Okay, thank you, uh, Secretary McCord. So to, to Kim and Mike, the co-chairs, I defer to you whether you think we should um, uh, entertain motion to approve this as amended, treat this as an amendment that you all as co-chairs think the group ought to consider Actually, in that way. I think because it's not um, on the consensus calendar, I think MD, the Department of Planning should make a motion to amend and take a, a vote on the on the amendment, and then take a vote on the um, on the final version, amended or unamended. That's fine. Um, I, I'll also move that it be amended according to what you see on the screen for number thirteen. Okay. Second. We have we do. Okay, everyone, please vote on whether to amend 13 as shown on the screen here. Please type yes, no, or abstain in the chat. Okay. 
okay, the yes is appear to have it. Uh, the recommendation is amended. Um, do we have a motion to accept it now that it's been amended? So moved. Okay, do we have a second? Second. second. Okay, again, please vote whether to accept it as amended. Yes, no, abstain in the chat. Okay. So 13, the yeses have it. Uh, moving to 14. 14 uh, is a large one. Um, we have amendments to multiple parts. We'll focus on uh, section A here. <clears throat> uh, I defer to the MWG co-chairs if you'd like to kick that off, Mike. And Earl, your hand is up. I don't know if that's a legacy hand. Um, but we'll start with Mike for to introduce this. Yeah, um, as I said at the start of it, we identified the two biggest issues we felt we faced were transportation and the slow increase of renewable power. We've got only seven utility scale um, solar power projects getting CPCNs in Maryland. Um, and the perception of the mitigation working group were that a lot of the part of the delay was uh, at PJM the queue, and that's sort of beyond our control, but it's being worked on. But another part of it is local opposition slowing down development of solar. And so a lot of these recommendations were designed uh, purely on the basis of how do we accelerate um, uh, solar development, uh, particularly um, over what could be local objections. Um, and um, uh, it, it you, you'll see in some of the recommendations are instead to give the locals more authority to um, uh, to block them rather than less. But the point is that we've got a deadline of uh, of 2031 to achieve the 60 percent reduction. A lot of what we're doing with cars and heat pumps and everything else uh, don't have nearly as much effect if we're powering. Um, those devices with fossil fuels, uh, and nine, eight years is not very long to get a solar facility built. Um, it, to site a location and get it built is probably going to take every bit of that time. So that's the genesis of the proposal. Thank you, Mike. And there are uh, proposed amendments. I, I gathered from your comments that you have an opinion on them as on them as co-chair. Yeah. I, I would oppose both admissions. Uh, the, the proposal from um, Department of Planning, the, the key to this proposal is that a county has to identify sufficient sites. Now, we use population based in the recommendation. It could have been based upon um, uh, the uh, electricity demand, but the idea of removing uh, any provision um, that mandated a metric that a county had to meet, to me, just um, defangs the whole provision. It has no meaning then. If it just says a county will work on this, well, uh, the problem is the local opposition that we have. And secondly, there's a reference, I don't know if you want to include these together or not, to county zoning ordinances. Mm -hmm. Currently, when the CPCN is thought, counties do not have the authority to use zoning ordinances. It's one of the few areas where the counties are not allowed to put objections in front of, of, uh, of solar development. So adding zoning back in, in fact, would be a big step backwards in our efforts to reduce the impact of local opposition in the construction of a lot more solar facilities that we need. So I, personally, I oppose um, both amendments. Okay, thank you, Mike. So this is complicated because we have multiple amendments. So I suggest that the order we take this is considering the Department of Planning amendments that were sent in advance in writing that are shown up here in red line. Um, and then we can consider the other amendments proposed by MAKO uh, and the Farm Bureau. I do see a hand up uh, from Wayne, but since we're considering the MDP amendments first, I suggest we start with Secretary McCord um, for thoughts on, on the rationale for the MDP amendments. Thanks, Chris. I'd like to ask uh, Jason from our staff to uh, 
uh, explain what's what's part of is really ours and what our concerns are. Jason, can you do that? Sure, of course. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, I understand um, the the what Mike Powell is saying. Um, you know, based on um, the main thing here, what these all these NSF and Redline are directly from us. Um, but you know, it's important to note that um, you know, doing a population based um, share would mean that Montgomery County, for example, based on our department's um, population projections, would be taking on twenty percent of the future solar um, facilities in the state, and that really doesn't make any sense. Whereas Ken County would be taking on less than 1% of future solar facilities again. So anything based on population or demand um, doesn't really make any sense here. Um, I mean, certainly we agree that counties should do their best to support solar energy. Um, and um, we have, a, you know, we have um, you know, web materials and guidance to help local governments craft those um, types of siting ordinances. Um, but um, ultimately, you know, county zoning obviously should accommodate solar where possible, but the PSC is already making rulings all the time where it finds that the county zoning is too restrictive. The counties don't have the last word on this. So um, this particular recommendation, um, as it was currently written, is, is not really going to succeed. Um, in its efforts. Um, so at the least, we thought that these, amend these amended language here would at least get the mitigation work group closer to where it wants to get, which is at least have the counties do some planning. Uh, all counties already are doing this planning already. A lot of them are working very hard to make this happen and balance multiple interests. Um, so I, I think that the, but our amendments are there really to try to make sure this is actually an effective recommendation. Um, it's currently written, it would not be effective. Thank you. Thank you, Jason and Secretary McCord. So uh, we'll go to the hands, uh, starting with Chairman Pinsky and then uh, Don Butchko. Yeah, I, I, I oppose the amendment and I'm very uh, torn on the proposal itself. You know, we have a number of projects, uh, solar utility scale projects that were in the queue. I, I want to say 15 or 18. And it has been over two years and longer for a lot of these projects because the counties have dragged their feet. Even though the state has authority through the perennial decision, um, PPRP and the Department of the Environment have not forwarded recommendations to the PSC for final approval. Um, and so uh, I don't want to make it more complicated. And, and I'm not sure that the language Clearly, the language in the amendment doesn't help, and I'm not even sure while I conceptually agree with my friend Mike Powell, um, putting another responsibility to the counties and they can say, well, it's taking us another six months, a year, two years to develop our plan could slow this down even more. So I'm not sure this solves a problem, which is indeed a problem. Also, I, I would add that under A, it doesn't talk about connectivity. You know, and some areas are, are uh, adjacent to the collectivity and connectivity and, and to other substations. So it's a complicated issue. And uh, we have a problem. We had to pass a bill a year or two ago to speed up the uh, timeline because projects were in the queue for years and years and years. I'm just not sure I see language in the, for sure in the amendment. And I'm not even sure in the uh, language as proposed that it solves this problem, although I would like to see this move faster, as many other people uh, have stated as well. Okay, thank you, Chairman Pinsky. Dom? Yeah, so um, thank you, Dominic Butchka from MAKO for the record. Um, so a few things on this. First, at no point was MAKO um, or local governments in general, MML, consulted, um, even when we were in the room when this was up for a vote. So you have a pretty big um, item here, and yet when local governments, it impacts us directly, We our opinion wasn't even asked. Um, counties are central to this uh, and a lot of counties are already doing this it was said several times already that you know we're already overburdened we're doing solar mako's language um, sets out incentives for counties to continue to be a partner and be at the forefront but anything that's going to be seen as a mandate and going to tie our hands further mako will oppose and the counties there are 24 very jurisdictions one size fits all in any category it really doesn't work in solar especially Thank you, Dom. And as a reminder to the group, Dom is here as proxy for Administrator Belton representing the MAKO seat 
So we'll turn to Mike, and then I suggest we call a question on the amendment. Yeah, just, um, uh, Senator, the concept, and if there's language that helps make it clear, we could certainly take it back before the next meeting, was that counties would have to designate sort of pre-approved areas. And it's, it's not meant to say that you can't build in the meantime or even are restricted to the pre-approved areas, but that counties couldn't simply sit back and say, well, we're going to wait until you've acquired the land and spent the money and then come and apply and then we'll decide whether it's okay or not. That they had to be affirmatively out there seeking locations. Um, and as I said, it could have been population based or it could have been demand based, but it's clearly intended to say that people like Montgomery County have to do their share. They can't keep counting on Kent County or, or the Eastern Shore farmland to be consumed. I should say, uh, I did not mention uh, Colby's um, uh, change. I, I don't have any problem with trying to look at the language about soil classifications. I do think the problem is that rather than building them in suburbs, we're consuming Eastern Shore um, farmland when we build at all. Okay, and so we do have a hand from Dom, and just for process, what I suggest we do is we vote on the amendment um, and then we vote on, I, I would say, Farm Bureau's amendment since it doesn't, it's different language. And then we vote on the recommendation as a whole. Dom, if we could ask whether MAKO would consider the amendment offered by MDE to be consistent with MAKO's concerns or not. Uh, no, we don't consider it consistent with MAKO's concerns. Okay. So you did you have another comment to make before we vote on the MDP amendment? Yeah, so just really quick on, on what Mike said. So right now, um, it, from the federal government data, 68% of energy generation comes from one county, Calvert. Yes, that is nuclear, it's not solar, but the whole putting a demand on a county where based on your population or usage, you have to now generate your electricity. We don't have a system like that now. And I don't understand why it would be a problem if some jurisdictions wanna take advantage and really build out solar and other jurisdictions for whatever reason can't do that. Our electric generating system already operates that way. I don't understand why we can't have it operating that way in the future. So just wanted to point that out. Oh, and as well as um, grade A soil classifications, actually side note on that, um, MAGO does agree with that. And grade A soil classification is crucial for our agricultural industry and putting solar over grade A soils is absolutely gonna kill the industry. So, and that's important. Okay, so I suggest to the group that we entertain and to the co-chairs that we entertain a motion to vote on MDP's amendments, and then we'll take it from there. I would make a motion to deny MDP's uh, amendments. Okay, do we have a second? Motion to deny and to deny and deny and deny. Second. Okay, we have a second. So this would mean voting yes means against MDP's amendment to maintain the recommendation as written. Voting no would accept MDE's, MDP's amendment. Please vote yes, no, abstain. Okay, it looks like the yeses have it. Um, so we are considering the um, recommendation 14A uh, as originally written. So we also have an amendment proposed by MAKO um, that was not in your materials. Uh, it was proposed uh, later. So I suppose we can open uh, Dom, if you'd like to move for the group to consider this, I see a, a hand up from Wayne. I'm sorry, Wayne, you may be reminding me that I suggested we look at um, Farm Bureau's next. And, Wayne. and Chris, I just want to say that I, what I heard from Dom is that maybe we can combine uh, Colby's into uh, Dom's and, and so build efficiency there. 
Um, I think you're going to get different votes on the two amendments. Okay. Just uh, I move to consider, and if Colby wants to add his grade A, we already have that, and I would consider that friendly. Okay, to help everybody see, I'm going to sort of undo the MDP amendment um, so we can see as it was original. Um, Okay, we have a we have a hand from Chairman Pinsky. Yeah, uh, I think we need to reject both these for different reasons. Um, the the language says um, for counties to designate sites for utility solar through zoning. Well, under the perennial case, they don't have that authority. The state has that authority. So I think this gives them increased power, which could actually slow things down. And secondly, as I read uh, Colby's um, recommendation, it, while I agree that uh, we should have non-productive farms in soil, th the way I read this language is the soil has precedence over everything else, including connectivity. Um, and I think that would be a mistake. And, and you know, farms that have grazing, may maybe the solar utility solar will be raised that would allow grazing. So I think this really restricts future um, uh, solar placement, utility solar placement, particularly in rural areas. So I, I would recommend um, rejecting both these, whether they're combined or separate. Thank you, Chairman Pinsky. Mike? Yeah, I was actually going to make the same uh, comment the Senator did about zoning. Um, this would be a step backwards. This would be allowing local groups more power to stop uh, a solar project rather than easing the uh, production. Okay, so we have a hand from Chair Dorsey. I suggest uh, to the group that we discuss the Farm Bureau Amendment, the, discuss them separately, Farm Bureau Amendment first, and then, um, okay, and then Mako. Yeah, and that was Steve my point. And we have a hand up from, from Hans for Department of Agriculture. I, I was just going to um, say here that, you know, we got to keep in mind that, you know, we're, we're trying to address the climate and trying to, you know, reduce our greenhouse gas. But let's not let's not forget that, you know, the industry is responsible for producing locally safe, affordable foods uh, to, you know, the citizens of this state. And so we need to protect the prime farmland for those activities for producing food. So. I think you know the focus really needs to be if the if the push is to put more solar utility solar in place that we need to really focus more on our non-prime farmlands and uh, protect the prime farmlands that can be uh, produce the foods that we need. Thank you. I see hands from Chair Dorsey and Delegate Stein. I I just want to. Um go back and and ask the question about um prime you know class three soils does that preclude agrivoltaics um i certainly wouldn't want to unintentionally exclude agrivoltaics as a a source of uh energy I, just to address that at least when we wrote it it was not meant to forbid um development but rather that in selecting sites, the counties would have to take into account the soil classification in picking their sites. So the idea was that they would try to avoid um, the higher class soils, but we did not intend there to be either a prohibition, and a flat prohibition, nor a, uh, a denial of the ability to do um, uh, agrivoltaic. For what it's worth, that was the way it was written. Okay, uh, Delegate Stein. Uh, just a clarification about the Farm Bureau's amendment. I see in the chat, Colby is saying that it's not a requirement, but would give priority to lower quality soil. So just a, just wanted to confirm that. Actually, Colby is saying what I, in the chat, what I said, I didn't see his comment till now, but at least as written, it was just to say that in selecting the sites, that the county would preemptively make available 
before even an application came in that they would take into account soil classification. Okay, and uh, Wayne, and then I suggest to the group we call the question on the Farm Bureau Amendment. We're running short on time. I mean, did we have, was that perhaps a legacy hand? So absent that, I, I suggest we entertain motion to uh, vote on the Farm Bureau Amendment on soil classification. Uh, I'll move to adopt the Farm Bureau's um, language. Okay, do we have a second in the motion to adopt the Farm Bureau Amendment? Second. Okay, everyone please vote yes, no, or abstain on accepting the amendment from the Farm Bureau in red. Chris, while they're voting, I, I think I'd like to um, consider extending this um, this meeting for 30 minutes. Okay, so the uh, those were votes on the, the amendment, not on Suzanne's time uh, suggestion. Uh, so let's um uh well i guess let's let's put out a quick feeler do people have an extra half hour to get through a couple more items before we close um <laughs> so this is a different vote guys um uh, those looking in the chat looks like we looks like we may be able to maintain a quorum um for an additional half hour I'm, I'm sorry, what was, what's the question we're voting on now? I... We are extending the time of this meeting for another half hour. Yeah, you can make a verbal vote on extending okay. the time. I, I hear, I see that there are some people who cannot stay, so maybe, um, I, I don't know, it's already done on the chat, so. <laughs> we, will, we will have to have additional time. We have some time at the next meeting, and we're going to look at scheduling additional time if we need it. Looks like it looks like the majority of people can can stay, so I think we'll be able to maintain a quorum. Yeah. So so with that, let's let's go okay. ahead and extend. So the final for fourteen A is we have um, the the Mako proposal, which uh, Don, I'm going to characterize this as an alternate recommendation. There, it's not really line edits. Um, would you like to? Is there anything else to say about this that hasn't been covered? Uh, as the commission considers it. No, I would just like to, I don't know if I'd make a motion, but make it be consistent with grades, uh, class three soil, soil instead of grade A. So otherwise, no, nothing else to say. So it would be class two or one, correct? If you're talking about a restriction? Yes, yes. Colby says, yeah. Right, Kim. Yeah, I have a clarification on that. Um, that I, I, my recommendation is we do not include any language regarding soil in this in Dom's because we just voted on that, right? We just yeah. approved the Farm Bureau, so I'm very confused about. We have two alternate, yep, we have two alternate options here. Both now consider soil class. Uh, the differences are in their form. Uh, the required designation um, uh, uh, um, and the plans and sites and the other language in the make recommendations that um, uh, our county's working to designate sites that are adequate uh, and the General Assembly providing incentives. Um, and then there are nuances with zoning that I understand Mike and Dom um, uh, have been discussing and the role of zoning. So I know that this is a really tricky thing for the commission to work through. Um, what I suggest is the thank you, Coley. There's requirement language around the soil classification. There's a must in the, um, uh, the MAKO option. So I suggest that we actually hold a vote for A or B, an A or B vote uh, for everyone to consider. But we have a comment from David Smedek. Thanks, Chris. I think uh, 
it was a half question to kind of check my understanding. I think that Colby explained it in the messages. I was I was a little concerned about providing any real specifics about soil soil classification within the uh, the update. But it, it does, if I'm understanding correctly, the one that was just approved was an amendment that the county should take into account soil classification and especially taking into account. Uh, as they're developing these plans, class three soils, but the uh, proposal from Dom and Mako would then say that class one and two soils or class must be restricted from solar development. And so that it, it's a difference between consider, you know, actively consider uh, soil designations versus no soil, no solar on these soil designation on these soil designations. Am I understanding it correctly? I'm seeing some nods, uh, Dom, okay. is that a fair characterization. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a fair and characterization. I mean, if there seems to be opposition to must, we can soften that. I mean, Mako is open to that. Th thanks, Dom. I, I, my, my concerns would still be there with, with that, especially that last sentence, but, but a lot of it, I think that we, I, I get concerned about as we're starting to really dive into the, the soil classes within this. So I, I, I'd be hard pressed. To, I, I think that we don't want to, Personally, it's not something I want to uh, have the commission move forward with, but okay. we'll vote. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. So I think we should entertain a motion to uh, accept the MAKO recommendation as a rewrite uh, or the MAKO amendment as a rewrite of the, the recommendation, right? So we're voting for effectively one or the other. That's what I'd suggest we accept the motion for. I was going to make the motion in a different form. I was going to make the motion that we accept the uh, a language as amended with the uh, in the original version as amended with the uh, Farm Bureau's uh, um, request and reject the um, amendment from the from Mako. Okay, so in that in, in that case, a yes Second. vote would be for the original as amended by Farm Bureau. A no vote uh, would be for the Mako version. Does that make sense? I heard a second, I believe, from Chair Pinsky. So everyone, please enter yes, no, abstain in the chat. Yes for the original as amended by the Farm Bureau, no for the MAKO. Okay. It looks like the yeses have it. We'll get the full count um, in the chat. Um, okay, so I would consider this uh, 14A now closed. That was a complicated one. That was the hardest one. We have uh, the four minutes left, we've extended the meeting for a half hour. Thank you and sorry to everyone for that. Um, so I suggest we keep on moving through. Um, we had a very minor amendment uh, to the final item of 14 um, from MDP. I suggest to the co-chairs we treat that as a friendly amendment, adding brownfield sites. I, I agree. OK, uh, so if anybody oh, opposes that. Okay. Please, please scream in the interest of time. Maybe we'll uh, call the vote. It. I'll make the motion. Fine. Okay. So, motion to uh, accept the amendment here. We have a second. 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 Okay. Please vote in the chat. Chris, we're just on K, correct? Just on K, the addition of Ann Brownfield. Okay. And Chris, in the interest of time, uh, yeah. would it be appropriate to make a motion to approve all of 14 at this point? I suppose we should do that to, to wrap up the conversation. So, because 14 was multi part and the rest, and it was sort of taken off the consent calendar in its entirety. So, 14 had a lot of parts. Uh, it was the most challenging issue, <clears throat> I think, for the MWG this year. So, we're entertaining a motion on 14. 
Um, I would have moved to approve uh, all of 14. Incorporating the amendments that we already voted on. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. So please vote on the entirety of 14 as amended uh, to include it in the draft report uh, for consideration in the November meeting. Okay, it appears the yeses have it. We've had several no's and abstentions. Uh, but the yeses had it. So we will continue moving next to 17. Um, we have a proposed amendment from David Smedic. The uh, recommendation was that the General Assembly should provide incentives for the optional net zero uh, new construction pathway in the, 20, in the forthcoming 2024 International Energy Conservation Code. We have a proposed amendment uh, to insert for all electric new construction compliance pathways within the optional net zero compliance. Uh, David, would you like to offer uh, thoughts on your proposed amendment? And then we'll turn to the co-chairs and discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. And, and I'll be brief because I know we've got some other big ones uh, to keep discussing. And I think my proposed language might not have actually been perfect rereading it. It was a rush to get the stuff in. So I appreciate that. What I The main message that I was trying to get across here was the all electric new construction uh, incentives are are important in the in the Climate Solutions Now Act. That was the the general movement was for um, electrifying building stock, um, with with varying degrees of of language within it. And I think that it's the the 2024 IECC code and and the optional net zero new construction pathways aren't final yet. Um, so we don't know the exact content that will be in there. Um, and I, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, or, or we could discuss it over email before the next meeting, but I don't believe that the optional net zero pathways will include a, uh, will require electrification within there. So if we're encouraging the General Assembly to provide incentives for new construction, um, I think having net zero all electric new construction standards is, is the way to go. Um, and so I think that the, this one needs a little bit of work, given the fact that the 2024 IECC isn't final yet. Um, we could reference the IECC in the final piece, but I think it really focusing in on all electric new construction and, and net zero all electric new construction um, is probably the way that we should be going to align with the Climate Solutions Now Act. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Co-chairs, do you have thoughts based on the MWG conversation on this amendment? Um, I, I think that I, I don't have a problem with it because I think um, the net zero construction pathway is going to be almost all electric anyway. Yeah, I think it is consistent with um, the conversation that we had had at the MWG. So then I suggest to the group that we, in the interest of time, consider uh, motions to accept the proposal as amended. Well, one vote to accept the whole thing as amended. Um, if there's not opposition to that approach. So moved. So moved. We have a second. Second. Okay. So the motion on the table is to approve uh, recommendation number 17 as amended on the screen for inclusion in the draft report for consideration at next month's meeting. Okay, the yeses have it. Um, on to 19. Uh, we don't have any, I believe we don't, I don't believe we have any proposed amendments for number 19. It was flagged for discussion. Um, uh, I'll start with uh, David as uh, the commissioner who flagged it for discussion. Would you like to say anything? Yeah, thanks, Chris. This, this is another complicated one. Uh, I know that instead of the full MWG discussing it uh, consistently, like the, the solar one that we just went through, there, there was a working group that I know put a lot of work and, and thought into this. And there were a lot of public comments earlier that um, discussed this recommendation as well. 
And I, I kind of see, I think, two pretty distinct recommendations within here. Um, and I've, uh, most of my concerns are around the first one, uh, the, the first part of the recommendation to me, which is to uh, have uh, changed the definition, kind of expand the definition of some qualifying biomass within the thermal renewable, renewable energy credits. I, 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 what I like about the second part of the recommendation in my mind is the development uh, and studying of a new program for thermal energy. Um, because right now I think there is some mess within our RPS. It's, it's not a huge issue yet, but I could see it growing if we continue to tweak this of having thermal energy versus electricity uh, within the RPS. So I like that part of the recommendation suggests we need to figure that out and have a new program for thermal energy. But I am concerned, and I think we heard this through the uh, public comments about in the interim, as a new program would be developed, having a lot of work done by the General Assembly or other groups to change the RPS again, if in the year, two years, three years, whatever it is, that entire work, we kind of get shifted out to a new program. So for me, I, I, I don't really like number one within this first paragraph. And I think that that's, uh, should either be extracted or eliminated um, within it, but then the idea of creating or, or studying or, um, developing a new program for thermal energy is is a worthy discussion for us to to be having as a commission and then throughout state policymakers. So for me, I, I have concerns about number one within this first paragraph here. Um, anyway, that that's my my introduction to it. Um, would be curious to hear from from other commissioners though on on your thoughts about this one. Okay, thanks, David. MWG co-chairs or participants in the biomass subgroup like to offer anything. Secretary Hadaway Riccio. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm actually not a member of this working group, but I, I do want to point out that thermal recs in the RPS are, are not new. They already exist in the RPS and they've been there for a long time. I think essentially what is contemplated here is decoupling wood from manure in terms of the existing definitions of qualifying biomass in the RPS. I think it's also important to, to clarify that this is not burning of wood or incineration. I think what is being considered here is um, new technology that is highly efficient and um, basically energy derived from the decomposition of organic materials and really would go a long way in helping us to solve some forestry management problems that we have in the state of Maryland. So I just wanted to offer those thoughts and clarifications. Bye. Thanks, we have a hand up from Chairman Pinsky. Yeah, thank you, Madam Secretary. It was unclear to me that this precludes or excludes burning. Um, you know, creating thermal usually is heat, and usually heat is created by burning things. So I guess I'm confused by this whole section of, of whether it really is about new technology or would allow certain uh, uh, pulp or, or, or byproducts to be burnt, that's my first question. The second question is, is this solely for T-Rex or does it affect tier one? And so I have a lot of confusion. And if it's just for T-Rex, um, will the next step be to expand the definition in tier one, which I would have major, major problems with. So I, I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, unclear on the purpose of this section. So qualifying biomass is one of the tier one categories. So this would amend that definition. Um, this is, uh, they're generally used for non carve out tier one than the RPS. Okay. We have a hand up from uh, Director Tong. Hi, thank you. Um, we just wanted to make sure, and again, I think there's a little bit of confusion here. I just want to make sure that um, this uh, or this uh, section would allow uh, use of food waste, human biosolids, and that that kind of thing. Um, 
we just want to make sure we can protect those as well. I believe those categories would be unaffected by these amendments. Um, any participants in the biomass subgroup, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this would be um, so to the extent those are already included, they would continue to be, but uh, I hope that's not incorrect. Uh, we have a hand up from David Lapp. And thank you, Elliot, in the chat. Sorry, I, um, I admit I too am somewhat confused by this. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Uh, and have concerns about um, how it may affect the cost for ratepayers. Um, I, my uh, general understanding is that this is more costly than like wind and solar. Um, and so it may detract from that and sort of um, shift emphasis um, from what we know um, can provide benefits. I, I think um, it, it may, may be what um, David Schmedic um, mentioned earlier in, in turning this into a study. It seems like we're, we're not, um, you know, recommendation to study this, like taking away, I, I don't see it on the screen right now, but it's further up, taking away one and um, uh, and to authorizing, well, it may, maybe that's not study language, but um, anyway, as, as it stands now, I think um, we have concerns about it. But might be willing to support language that would would turn this into a, a study so we can all understand this better and what the impacts are. Thanks. My and my understanding is uh, I wasn't around for the process last year, but this was an item identified for the MWG to consider, and there was a subgroup on biomass uh, this year that produced these recommendations. Um, I see Elliot in the chat, and I also know that MDE staff was involved, so I'd encourage anyone who participated in that subgroup to provide any process context that may be useful to the commission. Mm -hmm. I also I also think Colby. Um, was participating in that. And since this was something that neither Kim or I were directly involved in, it would be useful to have people in the subgroup comment. I'll add quickly, I was facilitating the subgroup. The intent was to modify the definitions of qualified biomass specifically for the TREC program and to recommend that the TREC program be moved out of RPS so that RPS uh, is an electricity only focused program and that the TREC program would move into a new thermal energy specific program. Thanks, Mark. Other states are considering programs like that. They often refer to it as a clean heat standard, sort of an RPS for thermal energy. David. Yeah, and I, I think a, a decent chunk of my like question or concern is around th this interim period of of modifying the rps the existing rps again um and provide i i think and i, I want to check this with with colby with um with elliot and others within in the subgroup but it sounds like it's it's to provide you know an, a bit of an expansion to the to the definition um for thermal recs if, if i'm not mistaken but again checking on that and and then if a new program is developed, if it's approved to be developed, if it's qualified, et cetera, like if that happens, then move everything over. So we're, we're kind of taking a step, like two different steps within this recommendation that feel pretty distinct to me because we don't know the outcome of developing a new program. Developing a new program for thermal energy, like a clean heat standard or something else could be very valuable to help meet goals, depending on how that entire process would happen and, and what the outcomes would be. Um, kind of like the last paragraph within this section. Um, but this first piece about changing the RPS thermal renewable energy credits portion in the interim is where I, I think I'm getting tripped up. Um, so I, I see Ellie raise her hand, uh, would love to hear additional clarification. Yeah, sure. I don't think we had um, considered the, that 
the order of the events the way that you laid it out. I I think it'd be at least personally, I think that in the intention of the group, I mean you could predicate one on two. So you could um, allow for the expansion of thermal uh, renewable energy credits once there is a developed separate program um, you know, within, nestled within within the RPS. If that's if the concern is you don't know, the expansion without the separate program, um, you know, make one follow the other. Would that be kind of uh, address your concern? Possibly, I think I think there's also a lot of question about what what the new program what its overall goals would be. And I think the last paragraph in this recommendation kind of gets to it, where it's about thermal energy as a whole, including um, heat pumps and other biomass materials and things like that. Uh, but it would be separate and distinct from the RPS, um, which again, as as David Lapp mentioned. There's a whole bunch of fun uh, or, or important questions about consumer impacts in that space too. So, so that's, you know, but but in general, I think th that does help me understand a little bit more, Elliot. Um, Senator Pinsky and Jeannie have hands up. I'll stop talking. Yeah, Thanks, Chris, can I make a procedural recommendation? Sure thing. Welcome. You know, I think this is a little complicated, and I guess I'd suggest people work on this offline. And we just understand at the next meeting this comes up with alternative language. I, I think there's some confusion. Uh, David has some recommendations. DNR has some recommendations. Rather than try to wordsmith it now, I'd suggest we pass on this, put a bookmark, and have them back with other language next meeting. Okay, thanks. We can definitely do that. Uh, Secretary, how do I Rico? Does that satisfy your hand? No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that is a good recommendation. We can. We definitely want everybody to have clarity around all these recommendations. I'll just quickly add um, regarding the price concerns on the renewable portfolio standard and just go back historically and say that when Maryland initiated the renewable portfolio standard, it was intentional that we try to include as many different sources as possible to really um, accommodate for market changes and changes in availability of supply. So. Um, this would be another tool in the in the tool chest, so to speak. And um, you know, there are a lot of other recommendations coming up that would change the RPS as well. So just you know, something to think about as as we move forward. Thank you. So number nineteen will remain on the discussion list. We'll pick it up again later. So now uh, we are on to some proposed additions. Um, uh, David Lapp uh, touched on these at the beginning in remarks. We will not get through all of these, but there will be more discussion time. But I suggest we keep on going, starting with um, with A here, and open the floor to the People's Council, David Lapp, to introduce the proposed amend uh, additions. Yeah, thank you, um, Chris. Um, I, I before we, um, I'd like to make some more general comments that, that reflect on on gas and fossil fuel. Uh, you know, consistency with the climate goals, and also the, you know, what what I what several people I treasure Davis mentioned the the cost impacts of of a lot of these proposals, and this is really about those cost impacts because we all know that. Um, let's see, I'm, I want to make six six general points, and then I want to touch on. I can touch on the first. Uh, First recommendation. The first point is that um, electrification, we all agree, BG agrees, everyone agrees that electrification is the path forward. We also know that fossil fuel use is inconsistent with uh, electrification and the state's climate goals. And we know that the gas utilities are spending lots and lots of money on infrastructure. Um, and so the question is whether we want to continue to spend all that money on that infrastructure and continue to incentivize customers to purchase gas equipment for their homes um, when uh, we're heading toward electrification. So uh, we, we issued a report, I would um, uh, refer people to our website uh, about gas spending business as usual, but the short uh, short story is that if we continue on the current approach, 
Um, over the next 70 years, the state is going to spend, our state customers will spend $100 billion on gas infrastructure. Now, that's just the infrastructure for gas. It is not um, the gas commodity price. Um, and that spending is going on every single day. So I'm not going to go into that report. We all know lots and lots of money is being spent, customer dollars. I'd refer you to that. I also have a an op-ed recently in Maryland Matters, and I'd refer you to that. Um, so that's one. Lots of spending on gas infrastructure. Um, the um, you know it's 1.2 million a day for BGE. It's 78 million uh, this year alone, 2022, in new for new customers um, and capacity expansion. That's this year alone. Okay, and that those costs, the 1.2 million. 78 million you got to multiply those out to account uh, over time those are recovered over decades and decades are being locked in now and that's just like the principal on your mortgage so you got to multiply that by three or more in order to uh, ascertain the entire cost to customers over time so that 1.2 million becomes a lot bigger uh, it, once you account for the equivalent of what is interest on your mortgage, um, and that's really the return to investors on that. So that is how utilities make their money is by investing in gas infrastructure. They don't make their money by selling the gas itself or the kilowatt hours in Maryland. They make their money by the infrastructure that they invest in, that they spend in every day. And this is why uh, BGE's report that has been referenced, it talks about uh, it, its premise is a continuation of both the gas and electric infrastructure programs. They ask, how can using those two infrastructures, both of them, uh, contribute to the state's climate goals? That's like saying uh, we have my old, uh, my old Chevy in the parking lot and I'm going to buy an EV, but I also want to rebuild my old Chevy. And uh, that doesn't make any sense. And that's where we are. BG's report talks a lot about leveraging the existing infrastructure, but it's it, it, that existing infrastructure doesn't exist. It's what is being rebuilt from 2013. BGE is only 30% of its way through. Um, so uh, I, I put in the chat earlier, um, you can look at Exelon's investor reports and the pages in the chat I referenced, but they show, you can see directly how important the capital spending is. BGE can't, can't produce a report that says, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, make our gas system smaller. They have to make it bigger. That's how their investors make money. So. Uh, the third point I, I, I really mentioned, and that these are investments that last uh, for years and years. Once that money, 1.2 million is spent, it goes in the rate base where it stays for decades and decades. So it's getting locked in. So that's why we need to, to address this problem soon because we're gonna have all these pipes in the ground that we don't know what's, what it's gonna be used for. And that's the fourth point. We don't know, BGE doesn't even know what it's gonna be used for. If you read the E3 report for, that they did for BGE, it acknowledges that. It calls it a hypothesis that this will be used. Well, their hypothesis is a gamble for utility customers. That's why this is a huge, huge ratepayer issue. They're calling it a hypothesis, but they do all that investment and once they make it, they're they're going to claim that they're entitled to every dollar that is spent even if it becomes completely useless because we we know that there are great uncertainties about rng and other uses of this gas um the fifth point is just the basic notion private investors would never be doing this they'd never be spending uh millions and billions on assets that they don't know whether, whether they're gonna be used or not. And this is not a debate about not knowing whether they're gonna be used. Look at the E3 report. Um, I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, Cal Calvin uh, Butler, the BGE uh, CEO, or, or one of the Exelon executives has said, 
We don't know what it has acknowledged. We don't know. It, it may be used for something different. Um, so that would not happen in a private market. This is gambling on customer dollars. Um, the, 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 the sixth point real quick is that um, BGE's report is useful and that it acknowledges that there are going to be huge declines in gas customers and in gas sales. Um, but again, it's premised on a continuation of that infrastructure, and it doesn't account for any reduction in infrastructure spending. Um, the other point is, is it foreshadows what we're, what we're going to be facing, and that is we are going to be facing large amounts of stranded costs. And we have to think about that ahead of time. Now is the time to mitigate those stranded costs. These, this infrastructure is being replaced. It's less than a third of the way through the replacement. The best way to avoid stranding costs is to, is to stop the spending in the first place. So uh, with that, I, I do want to, I'll, I'll stick with um, recommendation one right now. Um, and this is um, uh, th this is to stop uh, incentivizing through the Empower program um, gas appliances. And the PSC has said uh, they specifically said, well, the CSNA it didn't ban gas, so therefore we're going to continue gas appliance incentives. That's essentially what the the PSC has said. So the PSC needs guidance from the legislature to say stop uh, stop incentivizing uh, gas appliances. Um, I mean, this, this is like, we're, we're not incentivizing people to buy more efficient gas cars. We're incentivizing electric vehicles. So this is hey, very hey, similar David, to that. I'm gonna I, stop. Yeah, um, you, we got five minutes before we're gonna have to. I'm, 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 I'm done, on, I'm done. Thank so you. I appreciate yeah. it. So thank you. So we, we've introduced the topic. We're, we don't have time to find closure on that. So David, with your um, uh, uh, with your permission, I, I suggest we take just the initial round of uh, reactions that we have from a couple of hands, and then we will identify this as item number one when we reconvene, um, if, that's, if that's amenable. So the, the first hand sure. I saw yeah. was from uh, MEA, Director Tong, and then Mike Powell perhaps can give a co-chair Initial reaction, and then we'll pick this up. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I uh, and I think you might have already covered it. Um, Chris is um, I, I move that we table these amendments for further discussion later, since we're all just seeing them, and they really um, it appears that uh, time had run out on discussing them, so they need to be discussed. Second. Um, just to put this out there, um, if we're not incentivizing gas appliances and people are just going to use uh, less efficient gas appliances. I don't see where that's getting us anywhere. Um, and thirdly, I just want to remind everybody that 50% uh, of the homes in Maryland are, are heated by gas. Uh, if we take that away from folks suddenly, and I don't know that that, that I'm not saying that's what's being discussed here, but we got to be really careful about this uh, because of costs, particularly on low-income folks. Uh, uh, you know, we're sitting in the middle of Baltimore right now, just up the street here is, is, is gas. Um, and if we could get more efficient appliance and appliances into those homes, that would be great. And the other uh, aspect, of course, is safety issues. And we want to make sure that the um, gas providing companies are able to uh, continue their safety upgrades and whatnot on those pipes. So those are just a few things uh, that MEA um, comments we have. So uh, I guess the most important thing right now is just to table this amendment or these amendments until we can discuss them further. Thanks. Thank you, Director Chung. Uh, so then Mike Powell, Dave Smedic, and we'll consider a motion to table not just these, but all of the STWG items as well for when we reconvene. Mike? The, um, uh, the, these amendments did not get a discussion in the mitigation working group uh, because initially we did a, um, a spreadsheet asking support and it didn't get the 11 votes. You should not read into that. The mitigation working group would have defeated them, but um, that is the reason. It's not that there was an effort to deliberately ignore a proposal. It simply did not get enough votes to pass the threshold. Um, I would suggest that A does have some similarities to the recommendations we made in prior years, and therefore it might be something that with some discussion 
uh, could be something that at least I would recommend to the mitigation working group. I mean, I would not want the greenhouse gas reduction targets established by MDE. I'd want it by PSC because Empower is a PSC program. But but these items did not unfortunately get a discussion because it did not pass that threshold. Thanks. And David Smedic. I will save the vast majority of what I, what I would offer up uh, for the subsequent conversations. Um, but I, I do think these are really critical uh, points and they had been, the themes and a lot of the specifics had been um, uh, approved by the groups in the past, uh, by the commission in the past, past year. So I do think it's important for us to keep talking about and some of the new updates uh, that David offers in these, I think are really important. Um, look, looking forward to the, the next discussion. I'll, I'll stop, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I suggest we entertain motions to table all of the remaining additions and proposed amendments and also the STWD recommendations that have not been discussed for, uh, for when we reconvene. Understand that MDE will provide revised materials after this meeting reflecting the outcomes today, uh, highlighting what's left to be discussed, and we will consult with the steering committee about whether there's a need for additional time beyond the meeting that we already have scheduled um, in two weeks. That's so moved. Okay, do we have a second to table? Second. Okay. Uh, we have a vote on whether to table the remaining items for when we reconvene. Okay. The yes is have it. So we will table and we will pick this back up. Thanks so much, everyone, for the extra half hour. If these discussions were easy, we wouldn't need this commission. Um, as I said, MDE will, will provide uh, a roundup and a wrap up and we'll consult with the steering committee on additional time. Uh, yes, Chairman Pinsky. That's just being clear. Can someone on your staff look at prior recommendations that are similar to the ones that were in these uh, appendix or David's so we don't have to duplicate work? So if, if you could uh, sort of cross chart uh, previous recommendations that are similar, so we might not even have to discuss those that have already been uh, adopted and agreed to. It just might make it more efficient. Okay, we can do that comparison. Thank so, you. So, Chris, my understanding is that um, we will ask for another meeting, um, virtual meeting, and then we will, I just want to highlight to folks that on the night we intend to have a in-person meeting and it will be hybrid if, for folks who can't be there as the final meeting is that is that do i have that right chris we we will have to consider whether we think we have enough time on the ninth to cover what's remaining and then have the vote on the full report um which will be subject to the to the the first half of that meeting uh we i think i suggest we consult with the steering committee just on that time point to see whether we need to ask everyone for additional time perhaps we may ask for additional time to, to extend that meeting i think it is possible that we would we could get everything done in one meeting if we extend a little bit so uh, we may not be able to find a new time in the next two weeks that's um, that's what i was concerned about. okay yeah but but yeah we are meeting it's hybrid we welcome you here or at google or on google meet uh when we meet again uh just shy of two weeks from today on the 9th um uh, in the afternoon thank you so much everyone a lot of progress today important discussions still to come we'll be in thanks touch everyone with up shortly thanks chris